Okay, guys, we got a jam-packed episode for you today. We're going to be discussing why you should consider turning your pickup truck into an uplanding vehicle slash camper and some of our best spots that we visited with our truck campers in the Northeast United States. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to episode two of the Dishes and Fishes podcast. I'm Tyler. I'm joined by my co-host, Pasquale. Howdy. You're looking very fresh, I might I might add. Haircut. Nice haircut, brother. $42. Fresh fade? Yeah, I mean, we're on camera now. We got to look good. $42, dude? Yeah, I mean, it's 35 plus a tip. I know you don't like the tip, but I do. Most generous freaking haircut I've ever I mean, it takes a lot to make this band look good. Dang. Good for you, man. As promised, like I said, we've got a packed episode for you guys today, and one of the things that we're going to be discussing today is why you should consider converting your truck into an uplander, a, a camping vehicle. And if you guys have seen on my YouTube channel, Pasquale and I actually built the camping setup in the back of my truck. There's all sorts of different designs for it, but I want to start by just talking about the pros and cons of having the setup in the back of your truck. Uh, why don't, you, why don't you start us off with some of the pros, why anybody should consider this. Saving money, convenience, not having to like uh, make reservations like a week in advance. I mean, because we're always pulling a boat, so we have to, you know, keep an eye on the weather. So um, we're able now to just say, hey, it's Friday, weather looks mint, there's no wind, let's go. Jump in the truck and go. So convenience and, and saving money are two main factors for me yeah let's talk about saving money so i think you know we it's difficult to find a place to stay for less than 100 bucks so pretty much every time that you sleep in the back of your truck albeit how uh, hilarious that might sound <laughs> you essentially are saving 100 dollars. so for example my i think the cost of my setup was in the video, four sheets of plywood, a couple one by twos, wood glue, and screws, not including all the equipment and whatnot that goes inside the drawers. But it was probably a little bit more than three hundred bucks. The cap I got on Facebook Marketplace for another three hundred, three hundred or three fifty. I think three hundred ish. Yeah. He was there when I bought the cap too. Color matched matches your truck. Yeah. Sweet. Facebook Marketplace, it, it yeah. color matches my truck, so no no painting, no nothing. Made exactly for your truck. Yes, fit yeah. fit perfectly, fit for a to Toyota Tacoma. All said and done, let's just say 600 bucks, done, able to be slept in. I've slept in that thing five times as of this point-ish this year, so $500, it's pretty much paid for itself at this point. Your setup is a little bit sweeter than mine. A lot of it sweeter than mine. I got at least another three seasons, maybe plus, <laughs> until I could pay that bad boy off. My first original build was on my 2015 Silverado. I bought the cap, and the guy had this drawer system set up, so I ended up buying that off him, too. Long story short, I went with a newer truck, newer Silverado, and custom ordered a cap from Lear. And with the with the cap and the rack, it sent me back like forty two hundred dollars. Um, but I will say, yeah. So I will say the Lear cap. Uh, it was a tough toss up. Like if I was to do it again, I'd probably go with Smart Cap. Um, it's like an all aluminum cap. It's way lighter, and it was like forty eight hundred. What I'm noticing with the fiberglass caps and since COVID, a lot of the um. The quality in, in people's work has gone downhill. So when I got my first cap from Lear, it was actually the wrong cap. And I waited, what was it, like eight weeks for that? And then I get it, and it's the wrong one. Then I had to wait another three weeks for another one, and it comes, and there's like, it's a poor paint job. But long story short, it came with tinted windows, carpet-lined interior, and LED lighting. It's nice. Yeah, I will, speaking of the carpet lining, I will say that's a huge plus you know you don't get that moisture and you just feel a lot more warmer a little quieter when you're sleeping and so on so that's my setup and i'm sure uh tyler will post some pictures of it and you guys could check it out yeah do you have any that you can send me yeah definitely i'll put a picture of, of his setup right here for those of you guys watching on youtube it's pretty sweet six and a half foot bed he's got two drawers as opposed to my one speaking of six and a half foot bed those of you guys that drive the tacoma like me 
It is a six foot bed, which kind of stinks sometimes. It, I sleep, I can side sleep slash stomach sleep, but my feet still hang out, hit the, they, they hit the tailgate, so I have to sleep on a diagonal if I'm gonna sprawl out. So if you have a six, a six and a half foot bed, it's, it's definitely more key. Yeah, that's what I have, and I'm 6'5", and the way I sleep, I... You're 6'5"? Yeah. Jeez. Yep, they don't make them like me anymore. Oh, man. Yeah. Made in America. Made in America? Yeah. Freak of nature, is that what you're going to say? <laughs> so, yeah, I could just sleep, and I don't ever have to worry about running also, out of room. You and your son have also slept in that Yeah. Night. So how do you do that? So I have uh, the four-inch memory foam mattress hospital slash bed that I kind of converted and then my son sleeps on like a traditional camping cot um, it's a little bit raised so which is nice because I feel like it kind of gives a little bit of separation and uh, it works out pretty well so for, for my setup I actually pretty much started with the biggest mattress that could fit in the back of my bed so like my bed was like I don't remember the exact measurements, 53 inches by 72. I think that might be exactly what it was. So I bought the biggest folding mattress that would fit back there. And then we kind of designed the platform to be that exact size because I prioritized my comfort. So I wanted the biggest mattress possible. In retrospect, I think, I, I honestly, I planned for my wife and my dogs to be with me camping out, but it just never it just never panned out for the record my wife will never sleep in the back of my truck you know i wish i kind of would have just built like a little twin platform now because i see all the pictures of these guys with these dope like drawers and and it, it, it looks like straight out of a living room on their on their sites yeah i mean i have a two drawer setup i don't have like one size lower where i can stretch my legs out it, it, for me it didn't matter because i'm just tall it's never going to be really comfortable my setup is a true drawer setup where, so like they're six and a half feet. So they slide all the way out. One side is my kitchen. The other side is like my utility closet. Keep my rain gear, stuff like that, closed for the trip. But my whole setup is kind of just crawling and sleep. Absolutely. And store gear. You, you mentioned the drawers. You have two slide out drawers. Let's talk about the usefulness of the drawers. So w one of the things that I have on my list here is, for, for those of you that are considering doing this, it is so useful to have the drawers in the back of your truck, even if you're not fishing. Absolutely. Like I've got all of my tools in there. I used to just, I had like two toolboxes in my back seat. Not that I have passengers in the back too much anyway, but it just was cumbersome and like just looked messy in the back of my truck. But now I just keep all of my belongings in the back, rain gear. We'll get into specific gear here in a second. He has very unique items in the back of his, his drawer. I mean, you slide it open, he has like dish sponge toothbrushes uh it, it, it's pretty I <laughs> well i got all that stuff because my wife and i when i'm when we built the setup i was like we're going we're going away like we got to go to the dollar store and so <laughs> i just so stocked up on everything at the dollar store and like was grabbing soap and and every like all those random like toiletry items and then it turns out that you don't really use them like you you can you kind of use hand soap i bought like this stupid like a bag of water that you hang from a tree and it, and then you turn the valve and you can like wash your hands and shower and stuff. That's actually a good idea. I like that. I've used it twice. That's back there. But I, yeah, I do have some random stuff back there that I've never used. I'm pretty bare essentials. There's a couple things I might add next year, but like I, I, I kind of rough it too. You know, if it isn't a Ritz Carlton, my wife's not going. So it's kind of just like I just carry kind of an overnight bag with uh you know, my, my toiletries and if not, and I have added a roll of toilet paper, not that I'm probably ever going to want to use it just to have it essential. I, yeah. You never know. <laughs> so, but it's nice to just have the storage, you know, like I'm sure those of you guys listening, you might have like the metal tool chests in the back. I don't know. These are just, you build it yourself. It's probably cheaper than those metal tool chests. It's and it's more storage. You don't have to crawl up in there. Even if you're not camping a lot, it's useful Reason number one you should consider this, it's useful to have the drawers in the back of the, of the truck. The other part that I want to talk about, then you kind of already touched on this, is how this helps you in the event that, it, it, for your planning. So like if you book a vacation six months out and then Hurricane Pasqual rolls through, yeah, you're going and, yeah. you're, and you're not fishing a whole lot. So the reason that I love this is because a lot of our trips are just like, dude, let's check the weather Thursday. Yeah. It's been good. 
and then we just sent it. Yeah, and also like what we noticed too is when do we fish? Well, it's always in the summer, the warmer months. All these places are booked. We can't even get in the campground. That's we, another good we point. Have the, we have the ability to just pull up, think uh, one of our Lake George trips. Uh, after we finished fishing for the day, we, we went down the street and we parked in an abandoned hotel parking lot and we grilled ribeyes. Um, it was, we had the ability to do that. It was, it was great. You know, we didn't have to stop at a restaurant. So, I mean, we could literally pull over anywhere and sleep. That's actually something that we didn't talk about during the first time that we filmed this episode, by the way. Oh, this is the second time? Those of you guys listening and watching, we filmed this episode once and stupid Tyler over here, my microphone wasn't selected properly. So I didn't get, record any sound, but I sounded amazing. He sounded awesome and he looks better this episode i so. do i wanted to clean up a little the haircut was on point one of the things that we didn't talk about the first episode that you just brought up is how everything was is booked like crazy if you don't book this out like six months in advance yeah. so this really helps with that i remember when we went to like george like memorial day and i remember just cruising down the street and in like every hotel every campground every like cool there's tons of cool yeah. places they were all packed to the brim yeah, and we didn't and we weren't staying so, at any of those places and it didn't matter because we just sent it so even if we get into those hotels that you find a lucky one or a last minute cancellation and you get into these hotels uh it's great but then you gotta worry about we're always pulling a boat so a lot more people around am i gonna is my boat gonna get broken into are people gonna snip snoop around and can i fit so a lot of our phone calls when we call those hotels is two questions can we fit a boat in a truck and they're always like yeah they don't know what a boat and a truck look like um, or how long they are. So they always just tell you how to get you in there. And then they don't have any power. So we're kind of like, that's kind of what led us to the truck builds where these hotels don't have power anyway. At, by the time we get there, get comfortable, what do we spend? Five hours in the room. We don't even watch the TV. Oh, yeah. And sleep. yeah, we just sleep. So it's like, you know, on one of our trips this year, we went up on a Friday night real late, got up there, what, midnight? and uh new hampshire and we just said hey can i we jumped in our trucks crash woke up fishing it, it, it does its job 100 yeah. bucks in your pocket yep. speaking of how the truck life started we, we call these truck life with a y by the way those of you guys listening but i remember when pasqual pasqual brought when he bought his truck cap from the old chevy guy yep. this guy had these dope drawers and he's like i'll give them to you for 100 bucks that's right i thought they're 300 i might have said 300 there the cap my original cap my original build was 300 the box was 100 and it was pretty huge yeah so he obviously he brought it home i don't think when you went to that guy's house that you were thinking about nope. truck Didn't life even know he had it. yeah so so he brings it home he shows me i'm like damn it's pretty sweet like and then in my head i'm like I just can't do this, man. I just don't feel like buying all this equipment and making this thing. And, and like, am I really going to sleep in it? And then, like, I was really against it. Do you remember? Yeah, he was a Debbie Downer. Though. I was a Debbie Downer, dude. Like, yeah, I wasn't feeling it. And and I was kind of like... You're like, you want this. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I, it I, It's just convenient. It's just nice. Like, I honestly... Stay in the back of my truck by myself or stay in a hotel room by myself. Either or is, is whatever. At least one way I'm saving money. I don't remember the exact moment where it kind of clicked for me, like, yeah, I'm going to do this. It took a while. It did, but, like, I'm so happy I did because I use it every freaking day. Yakima makes this 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 pretty cool tat that goes on top of the truck rack. I'm really thinking about adding that. Um, it, it, it's pricey. But I was like, you know, I'm a big guy. My son's big. And it would be pretty cool to, like, have two separate pl- – it would be, like – a two-family house in the back of my truck. truck. I, what does it sit? It, it sits on top. Yeah. So, so I have on my new cap. I got the uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got Sorry, the, Kristen. I got... <laughs> no one tell my wife. <laughs> so I got. I have the rack set up on top of my cap now, and I might do like a pull-out canopy on it, and it's it's pretty cool because it basically it, it like folds out like a pop-up camper. And it it has a ladder, and it all stows in, and it's waterproof. And I don't know. I was, like, thinking about, like, that just might be cool just to have. Yeah, (laughs) it would be. I I would imagine it would be difficult to set up, maybe. Like, truck life is just... You didn't talk about this either. You were contemplating doing, like, one of those truck bed tents. And so was I when I was, like, started 
thinking about this idea of you know truck life i i was gonna do um just one of those truck bed tents but then pulling the boats and being kind of off grid you can't really fly under the radar setting up a a dome tent in the back of your pickup truck and i mean you remember, yeah remember you were talking yeah, it, about it the, looks sus it definitely looks sus. <laughs> yeah. and uh i there's something about having the hard sides the hard walls nothing leaks yeah you feel safe yeah and, yeah. and it's kind of like on the dl exactly speaking of on the dl that we didn't talk about in the first filming of this episode is how do you select where you're camping oh nice this could be a better show yeah absolutely it will be <laughs> so basically <laughs> i think your response to this question will, will be better than mine but how so pack when we go camping in the trucks yeah like how do we how do we pick where we go like, what do you mean? Hang on. If you want me to answer, I'll say there's literally no plan. Oh, there's no plan. No. <laughs> yeah. Like, so that's, that's like when you're trying to stay in a hotel, there has to be a plan. When you have truck life, there is no plan. That one Lake George trip, we just basically were like, let's drive. We drove 10 miles down gravel roads to get to a place to sleep at, at midnight with boats. And nothing was planned. We stayed on probably a very sketchy dirt road where people all night long drove by in off-road vehicles. It was mostly ATVs. Yeah, and like, <laughs> I didn't sleep good. Um, but the, the whole, what I'm getting at is we don't have to plan anything. We just go. I have a video of that trip on my channel. And speaking of not sleeping good, I parked kind of on an angle. So I was like sliding down the truck bed all night. And I talked about that in the video, but yeah. that was my first truck life attempt but there's no need to plan because honestly like the only thing we plan is like what lake we hitting all right let's go so then when we get there it's like what spot looks the least conspicuous and most convenient to the boat launch yeah <laughs> pretty much i use the google maps where it shows actual terrain and that's where what i started using recently i could see the actual picture of the ramp and I could see how it looks, how many parking spots. I can almost see if there's a porta potty there. I could see a lot of cool things um, from the satellite view of the actual terrain. I could see it's a paved ramp, a dirt ramp, um, how many houses are close by, and if there's a gate. There's a lot of things you could see. And I started using that, and that helped tremendously on a couple of our recent trips. We're going to get into some of those specific uh, spots here in a bit. But Google Earth is definitely your best friend if you're kind of like, if you have some time to plan ahead, check out Google Earth. If you don't, I think, man, gut instinct also is, is really yeah, good. Go. Yeah. You could always stay in a Walmart. You could always stay in a truck stop. And even you, you said this before, like we're, we're two guys with like decent equipment. You know, we don't, we're not causing trouble. We're not drinking. We're not doing anything stupid. You're staying in uh, any parking lot. If a cop pulls in and he sees... You know, I got a, a new rig and a, a, a pretty, you know, nice boat. Uh, they know you're not up to. They're just going to say, hey, you can either stay the night. They might check you out, but no one's calling in suspicious vehicle. You got a boat behind your truck. Either they might think you stole the boat, but you have all, everything checks out. You have nothing to worry about. Just go. Right. We, we ran into a few cops late at night, and they were all really, really oh, nice. Yeah, Shouts out cops. Yeah. We support the blue. Yeah, absolutely. Back to blue. One last thing I use my truck life for, and you do this too, and, and there's a lot of customization that you can do with this, is the electricity. So the, the video that I shot recently, tomato the tomato and zucchini tart video that I shot, you guys check that out. It's a banging recipe. Yeah. yeah, I had it. It was great. Yeah? Yeah, you brought some over. Your son had it too, right? Yeah. I don't think... No, he liked it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when when kids like it, you know it's good. But when I shot that video, I had all my ca my camera gear in the back of my truck charging. So that's, that's another reason why, you know, if you guys look at my TikTok, I have how we set up the charging ports back there, the USB charging ports. So like when I'm doing stuff without my boat, I can just have my stuff charging right in the back of my truck you have a usb yeah i mean it's a big lead battery i'm i don't really use it as much as i thought i would i'm going to change a couple things i might put a small lithium battery back there just for some lights and stuff but i it would just be for my phone and usually with charging it on my boat or in my truck when i'm running i really don't need it and i like i said the the new cap came with all wired led lights so i kind of solved that issue yeah any more reasons why somebody who has a pickup truck might want to consider doing this? I think it's just 
just cool, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's dope. Yeah, hey, it's done. I'm, I'm, all right. Yeah. I mean, I people are like old man truck, and then like like when I open it up and I slide out the drawers, like it's cool. Like it's you know I have a kitchen, and I thought about using it for other things. Like for instance, we're gonna do every year we do our Christmas tree tailgating, and I'll I'll bring the kitchen set up there, slide out the drawers. Uh, we always do some grilling and I'll have coffee going and whatever, you know, it's like, it's nice to have for tailgating for sports events. Like, you know, you can do a lot of cool things. And if you need to sleep somewhere, like sleep right in the back of your truck. I don't know. Like the other, the other thing that we talked about was for trout fishermen, fly fishermen, hikers. If you want to pull your truck right up to the stream, it's, yeah. it's kind of sick to just, you can literally back up right next to the running water. Just make sure that you're on flat ground. But you don't have to be a bass fisherman. You, you could be a camper. You know, yeah. you could, you could, I'm sure like national parks, I, I don't, I'm not like a big hiking buff, but I'm sure there's places where you can drive your car into the national park, pull yeah. over on the side of the road and just do this. Yeah, remember we guys, we're pulling boats with them. So if you're going to do this and you don't have a boat, I think it's a lot easier. There's a couple people on YouTube I follow. They, they built these same setups and they pull into New York City, right? And we all know how expensive New York City is. They'll literally park their their uplander vehicle on like the side of some spot, and they spend the night there for free, a couple nights. I mean, that's like you're in like downtown Manhattan or whatever. With that's not a bad idea. No, exactly. Urban camping. Ooh, that could be. I'm down. Hey, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. I'm down. We'll be cooking ribeyes in the sidewalk. I would. Get out with the locals, rubbing elbows. I'm down. Be careful. Stay safe down in New York City. <laughs> so those are all really good reasons about why somebody might want to do this. Let's talk about why somebody would not want to do this. And I don't have a whole lot here. I do get the old man truck with the cap. Let's talk about that. Uh, I've never heard that. Old I man have. truck? I mean, was... come on. I get it. Really? Yeah. I got gray right here. Like, now. Especially your truck looks like pretty rad. It's a 20... I know. 20... 2020? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 2019. 19? Yeah. I don't think it's black. It's freaking yeah. Z21. What kind of old man would drive that? <laughs> the, the, I mean, we could talk about the, the clear obvious. Like, if you need to use your truck to do truck stuff. No, truck stuff is a big one. Yeah. And, and my biggest example is, you know, I have to take this out of my truck in the winter to move my snowblower around. Yeah. Because my mother-in-law shouts out Carrie, shouts out Hema. Asked me to snow blow her driveway. And you better. Uh, of course I will. Hema, got you. Got your back. I don't want to put the snow blower on top of all of my wood and get it all stained and, and snowy. But I did polyurethane to protect it. But Mine was protected by deer blood. I have a, a blood stain on my box from the previous owner. All natural. I, I tried sanding it. It won't come out. It's just there. Maybe it's like a ritual thing. Maybe, no. Yeah, definitely. Yep. To do my truck stuff, I'm actually going to take my truck life out this winter. That's the big... Big reason, and you know, I, I have moved loads of firewood a few times, and like, I got like not out of state. Fire. Shout out to our neighbor Jesse. Shout out Jesse for keeping our firewood movements in check. <laughs> but I have got like sawdust and bark everywhere back yeah. there. It's kind of yeah. sucks, but or dump runs. Yeah, I took the wife uh, grocery shopping, and it was great because I was able to throw all the groceries back there. Hot date. Yeah, <laughs> you got to take the ladies out once in a while. Yeah, yeah, truck life definitely enhances the storage for sure. Yeah. There's definitely more pros than cons. I have no no reason to defend it. You know, I just there's not a lot of cons. If you do a lot of truck stuff, if you're hauling equipment that has fuel, oil, like dirtiness, probably can't do it just yeah. because your wood is going to get trashed. But they do make plastic and aluminum like prefabbed. Yeah, shelves and stuff, right? Yeah. There's there's companies that make stuff you can just buy and put it in your the back of your truck. Uh, uh, albeit you need to turn in your man card while you order those things, but <laughs> they probably hold up to gasoline and oil and water better. I don't have any really cons to it. I think it's uh it, it's it's a lifestyle. It helps with what we do. We're not big ice fishermen. We're gonna dabble into that this winter, I think, a little bit more than we have. Um, shout out to Nick. Captain Nick, we're going to go ice fishing. I really want to put my truck in the middle of some frozen tundra. Shout outs to my insurance company when they cover a complete loss of a truck at the bottom of some lake. I'm fully prepared for that. My wife is definitely not going to be happy. She's going to skip over this. She's going to double tap. Yeah, she don't even watch the whole podcast. So My only other con is, the like, and honestly, this is just me like 
scrounging to think yeah. of stuff is the build process and the cost, which we talked about the cost was low. If you shop around, you can definitely find a cap that fits your vehicle for relatively cheap. Yep. Facebook Marketplace, Magical Place. If you're not picky about the paint job, honestly, I got so lucky when I got mine. Yes. I was about to, we were about to drive to Massachusetts like an hour and a half away to get a black one yep. for a hundred bucks yeah. that would have fit my truck. Yep. And then literally I DM the guy on Facebook Messenger. I was like, dude, I'm coming Friday after work. And then the one that I currently own got listed Thursday and he's like, dude, yeah, make an offer. So I did and got it that Thursday. And yeah. it was the paint matched, perfect fit. My Yeah, my, my first cap was champagne color. And my first Silverado was a burgundy color. I rocked that for a little bit and I felt complete redneck and I had to paint match it. And it cost me a thousand to paint match it. So that cap, the first one was roughly $1,300, which was still worth it because I knew how much they cost. Other than that, I really don't have any cons. If you get dirty in the back of your truck a lot, think about that. I have to take mine out in the winter, which isn't too big of a deal. I just need a place to store it. Shouts out my neighbor, Pack, and my co-host, Pack, and my set manager, Pack. I wear many hats. If you can get over that, truck life is for you. That being said, those of you that are still here, let's talk about the essential must-have items for your camp setup. So we've each got three items that we think are essential to have in your truck camping setup. And I'm going to start with my first one. And that is, it's a very basic, stupid item, the electric fan. It's dumb. It's cheap. I'll put the link for mine in the description below. I got it from Amazon, but it's chargeable right in my USB chargers right in the back. So I just plug it in. I hang it from the, it has like a little metal clip on it that I just hang from my truck cap. And honestly, it's more for the sound than it is the actual fan. Oh, yeah. Like, when you guys are in these spots, the truck life just cancels out all the sound from the outside world. And when you're in there, it's, like, eerily quiet. So the electric fan kind of just makes it so you can sleep peacefully, sound-wise. And if you're in a hot place, it's even better. But more so than, like, everything else I have in there, electric fan gets used every trip. First couple trips, something was missing. I run a fan. It's a Ryobi 18 volt lithium fan. Shouts out Ryobi, sponsor yeah, Ryobi. me. All the tools that I borrow from this neighbor here I are Ryo Ryobi and they work awesome. Never fail. <laughs> Never fail. So yeah, I run a fan too. So that's definitely on the list. Yep. What's your number two? Uh, my number two would be my $3 tongs I got off Amazon. <laughs> Listen, I grew up in the restaurant business and I went to culinary school. A good pair of sturdy tongs is worth its weight in gold these tongs were on they made the trip for me fair enough they were quality you gotta admit they were nice tongs three dollars amazon shout outs my second item that i listed here is comfortable sleeping platform so don't be a bum and yep. like cheap out and you're sleeping like like i said i i bought a memory foam mattress for mine which was like 150 bucks i guess that adds to the cost of this whole rig but the the mattress allows me to sleep for multiple nights comfortably yes. and i can't fish if i don't I, I can but i i i fish a lot better when i sleep well comfortable mattress allows you to get that good solid night's sleep and stay in the truck for multiple days i was when in the beginning stages of this whole thought process i was thinking about doing an air mattress i'm a bigger guy i you know air mattresses are great until you wake up ha halfway through the night laying on nothing cuz they deflate <laughs> The memory foam mattress, if you go that route, it's not only comfortable, not only supportive. I mean, we've stayed in a lot of bad hotels for 60 bucks a night that the mattresses are like nothing. The, even there, it's like sawdust and feathers. These memory foam mattresses are like, they're not only they're comfortable, they're supportive. They're, they're huge. Um, I don't think we'd say insulators, but they, they like, they help you stay warm. I wouldn't even say you need a sleeping bag because I do have a sleeping bag. But more as I'm going to go on, I'm probably going to rock a comforter and really nice. I have really nice pillows. My setup is nicer than most hotel rooms. Yeah, I believe it. Honestly, my wife's probably not going to be happy with this one. But speaking of comforters and whatever, like when we're going on truck life trips, I just back into the driveway and then I have my I have my mattress in there. My mattress is still in there. Just it's in there all year. Yeah. But then when we leave, 
I just throw in my blanket and pillows from my actual bed. <laughs> so like, like I get a nice comforter and pillows for yeah. every trip, yeah. but it doesn't matter though. And I, I keep a rolled up sleeping bag underneath the bed too. So when I, so when we get to the place, I have mattress sleeping bag that I keep in there. And then I have blanket and, and, uh, pillows from my actual bedroom and it's freaking lit i uh, honestly sleep better in the back of my truck at this point than i do in any hotel room if I, we're going for a one night trip i don't sleep at all in that hotel room it takes me time at least in the truck i know it's like my own oh that's stuff totally. i'm comf i'm i'm comfortable I, I i know my surroundings and you do snore slightly so yeah. coming from a grown man that's that's spent many a night in hotels with you not in the same bed. <laughs> you so <laughs> It's quiet. There's no snoring. It's peaceful. So my second item is a comfortable sleeping platform. My last item, before you can even use tongs, you need something to cook the food on. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And we all, we both carry two things to, to cook food on. I think one is better than the other, yep. but... We both have Coleman grills. I got my Coleman grill from some gentleman on Facebook Marketplace for 50 bucks. Then we also both carry a two burner camping stove yep. from Walmart. It's a cheap one. Ozark Trail, it's like, it was like $16. Yeah. It works like it's cheap too. Which do you prefer, Pasqual? The way I have it set up, it's kind of in, in my, one of my drawers. It never leaves a drawer. I pretty much will boil water on it, make coffee on it, but I will say, if I didn't buy it, I could definitely survive with just my Coleman Roadmate. Absolutely. Yep. And the reason I prefer the Coleman Grill. Shout outs to Coleman. Shout out to Coleman Grill. All your product. Reach out, Coleman Grill. <laughs> We're always looking for. Send us tongs. <laughs> I don't think they make them, but if you do, we'll endorse them. <laughs> I prefer the Coleman Grill because it's like you remove it from your truck, you fire it up, you grill. You throw it back in. The The only reasons that I don't like it, it, as you know, is because it stays really hot after you use it. Yes. So you have to leave it out of your truck. So don't cook while you're kind of on the move. It's way better than the camp stove because the camp stove, you have to bring like a pan with you. And my cast iron pans, I pride myself on like keeping them freaking mint. They're just well seasoned, well taken care of. I don't like lugging them around the back of my truck. You have to clean the pan. And, and the Coleman grill, you don't have to clean until you get back from the trip. You, I guess you could do the same thing with the cast iron, but the, the Coleman grill is way easier. Yeah. I do have a little, like, little, little coffee maker I put on that. I was going to say. Top. On the coffee maker note, the two burner stove is key. He, he makes a mean cup of joe. Yeah. And without it, you couldn't do that. He's got like a little percolator. Yeah. I mean, it's great. We're kind of like wake up, hurry up, and go fishing. So, I mean, we're more like iced coffee. You know, you learn as you go. That's that's the cool thing. Like, I want to start doing more camping without the boat um, because, like, you can wake up. I know. Trust <laughs> I don't know. Like, wake up. We don't have much time. So, to yeah, sit there and, and wait for coffee to percolate, we're like, we, we start getting shakes because we got to catch fish. The only thing about the, uh, the percolator is when the coffee's done, it, it's like it was just boiling. So as opposed to your coffee maker, when you can drink it, you can't drink this for like 20 minutes. Oh, no. This is like, this would be, it's like, it's like liquid lava. So right. it's something that would be nice, like to keep your hands warm. It is another thing to have Ozark Trail. Yep. I don't even know if I want to shout them out because all their products seem like they're dollars. Shout out to Ozark Trail. Oh, yeah. Shouts out. All their products seem very cheap. Shouts out. <laughs> I like cheap. But they also function cheap. <laughs> but... It's nice to just have the burners, but Coleman Grill, definitely the way to go. Anything else? What's your third? Uh, that was my third. So I had electric fan, comfortable sleeping platform, and something to cook on, Coleman Grill. I would say tools of some sort. Bring some bring some like basic toolkits with you. You know, that would be good to have in your truck. So everybody listening, we, we've both got a variety of tools in our trucks. Obviously, like a standard socket set, wrenches, whatever. Pasquale also has encouraged me to carry a jack, a spare wheel hub for your trailer. What else you got in your truck? For um, jack. I have extra uh, a bearing, whole hub assembly. I run two spears on my boat. I had a blowout on the way to Clayton this year, and my son's freaking out, and I was ready to go. I had everything I needed to take care of the situation on the way there, and I still fished. Always assume things are going to fail and bring Absolutely. those things with you. Yep. But. So that kind of concludes the pros and cons and essential gear. 
of the truck camping setups. But now let's move into the best spots that we've been to in the Northeast USA. Are we sharing locations? We're going to share some juice with the viewers. Those of you guys watching on YouTube probably get a little bit more. If you want any like details, just message us, uh, me or Tyler, and we'll we'll get you any info you need. Love that. I'm I'm all I'm all about that. So let's start with our top three lakes slash fishing communities that we've visited in the Northeast USA, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off. My number three spot, best spot in the Northeast USA that we've visited is Lake George. There, there's lakes that fish better than Lake George. There's lakes that fish a lot better than Lake George. But, dude, Lake George is awesome. Yeah. Like, the downtown, it, it, it's basically, it's a small downtown. There's one, like, main drag of restaurants and uh, stores and stuff. And we also, you know, prior to Truck Life. Lakeview. Shout out Lakeview. We'll give you that tip. Lakeview, um, right now, I think it's like $62 a night. $60 a night for a room with two beds. There's a great guy there that runs the office. I believe he's the office manager. He actually watches the boat the whole night, and I believe he does. He doesn't sleep. Um, we There's power, and it, it's good. So in front of Lakeview, there's a place to park your boat. There's a power outlet. Everything's safe. <laughs> and the best part is it's right across from the boat. Do you remember how close to – sorry, I have to talk about this because this is why I love Truck Life. Um yeah. Do you remember how close the toilet was to the wall and I couldn't fit between the wall and the toilet? The guy in the office said it was one of the best rooms he has and the cleanest. Oh, and actually he left us with a nice fist hole. There yes. was a nice fist hole in the wall. There was a fist hole in the wall. He said it was the best room he had, the cleanest. So I had used the, the, the facilities in the hotel room and I could not fit between the toilet and the wall. <laughs> Well, that's that's why that the, the hotel got a four star. I still gave it a four and a half. <laughs> For sixty bucks, that hotel is legit. Lakeview Inn. If you guys don't have truck life, the town is awesome. And you know, as opposed to a lot of these other areas that I have on my list, Lake George, it although it is like a commercial area, it doesn't really feel like it because it just it just feels like it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Even if you drive around the outside of the lake, there's like pine trees and, and it is that evergreen tree feel everywhere. There's not a lot of houses. It feels like you're in the middle of nowhere. And there's a lot of lakes that fish better than Lake George, but because of it's like really awesome town, everybody there's nice. The, the restaurants are awesome, the stores are awesome. And because it feels like you're in the middle of nowhere, gives you a ton of options yeah. for truck camping. It's my number three. Yeah, it's, it's a glacier lake, so you could pretty much see when you're on the water that the glaciers just ripped through and carved its path, and it's some it's it's like a lake in between valleys. You did, and, a, little, did a little soil research. Yeah, absolutely, it's a glacier <laughs> lake, so Geology. it's it's beautiful, it's beautiful. So my number three, and it's gonna be a shocker, Lake Zor. I love it. It's my home lake. Calm down over there. Um, it's a great fishery for walleye, smallmouth, largemouth, um, pike. 12 pound brown trout so it has to be my number three it has to be on there it's just my go-to lake it's like comfort food of lakes <laughs> yeah no uh lake zor is our home lake tiger musky shouts out lake zor it's got all those species that he mentioned the brown trout was not really expected no that day no absolutely not and i've got a video with that catch guys if you want to check that out i'll put it in the description below but yeah that lake is kind of just like you can junk fish, you can fish banks, you yeah. can do whatever you want. You can catch smallmouth, largemouth, but you can catch you can catch numbers of fish there. Absolutely. That's in South Barry, Connecticut. My number two lake on my list here is Lake Champlain. And let's talk about Lake Champlain for a second. I'm gonna put a topographic map shot of Lake Champlain right here in the frame for those of you guys watching on YouTube. But the lower half of Lake Champlain is completely different than the upper half. So if you're fishing like Ticonderoga, th this past summer I went to Virgin. The whole vibe of that end of the lake was very, uh, like the low water visibility, it kind of felt like river fishing, it was like a really narrow lake. The best part of Lake 
Champlain is the northern end, specifically Burlington. And, my, and the, the reason that these lakes made my top three is, is not only because of their awesome fishing, but because of the awesome communities that they are in. So like Lake George has awesome restaurants, has awesome people, campgrounds, just an awesome vibe. Lake Champlain has probably 20 different towns that you can stay in while you're fishing there. But my favorite one was Burlington. My wife and I stayed in Burlington and there's like all these restaurants and there's all these breweries and shout outs to Burlington, Vermont. Shouts out to Burlington, Vermont. But there's all this stuff in Burlington. There's farmers markets. We stayed right on the lake and on the northern end of that lake, it's all crystal clear. So my favorite place to launch on Burlington on Lake Champlain is Mallet's Bay. You could literally fish on Mallet's Bay only in a day and you could stay busy and catch fish all day long. The cool part about Lake Champlain is you can just do whatever you want. So if you're like, yeah, I'm going to catch largemouth, you can go find like epic grass lines in the coves. You can find sweet docks. It's all crystal clear. It's all really, really healthy. You can do that. If you're like, I want to catch smallmouth, you can go offshore. You can find rock piles. You can find deep rocky banks. It's got everything. It's got it's it's the best largemouth and smallmouth lake I've ever fished, combined with the dopeness of Burlington. Yeah, guys won tournaments catching smallmouth or largemouth, so it's kind of unique that you could go one way or the other. Just pick whatever you want to yeah. do. Like yep. the inland sea, the top part of Lake Champlain. I've fished way better. It's been way more crystal clear and fun. The bottom part, I'm sure we, you know, we ran into a few guys down there that were like, I'm fishing for catfish and <laughs> no, seriously. And, Muddy and, water. And yeah. And they, they were cleaning up with, with catfish and we stayed in this area that was like all beautiful mm-hmm. farmland. I think I have a couple shots I'll put right here of driving through. It was just so beautiful and like nobody was around where did we launch on the New York side? That was a pretty pretty cool ramp. The wind report on that day was like, they said 10 miles an hour. Really, really check the wind. Yeah. So what I learned about fishing uh, there in, in my number two uh, up north is watch the wind. Because uh, we were in like six foot rollers. <laughs> Lake Champlain is its own animal, though. Yeah. It was a rough go. Here it is. We we stayed. Were we at Lake George before that? Yeah, that was our. So that was our my uh, eleven and a half hours of driving that day. Three different lakes. We started at Lake George, <laughs> went to Lake Champlain, and then we ended in Great Lake Sacandaga. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here we go. We la- we we launched on Champlain in April yep. in Peru. Yes, Peru. Uh, for those of you that are in South America, shouts out South America. Shouts out to that ramp in Peru, yeah, New York. Yeah, actually, that ramp was legit. It, it had like a bathroom and shower. Very dope bathroom. Yes. That that ramp was awesome. You can sleep there. For those of you guys that do trunk camping, you could just sleep right at that ramp if you want. Yes, you can. Plenty we launched. We were fishing. I think we caught one or two fish, yeah. and, and then... The wind was absurd, and and on the on the weather forecast it said nine miles an hour. So if you're on Champlain, nine miles an hour, you have to double everything. We went half hour away from the ramp when we decided that it got too nautical out there to head in. It took us an hour and a half to get back. Yeah, it was it was gnarly. There was like, it it was the only time that I've ever felt on my boat like. Dang, I might not make it back. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I used to ocean fish a lot and had had a pretty uh, big ocean vessel, if you will, at one point in my life. And I was like, yeah, we shouldn't be out here in a bass boat right now. Absolutely, but regardless, it's absolutely beautiful up there. Champlain's my number two. I love launching in the Burlington and North End, fishing the inland sea. You can fish any way you want, and you can absolutely clean up. My number two. Ready for it? Drum roll, please. It's St. Lawrence River, Clayton, New York, Alexandria Bay. Um, uh, what can I say? It, it is the town is un- unbelievable. The people, the people are the nicest. When people, when we started going up to New York, we're, our biggest thing we noticed was these are not your typical New Yorkers. These are just super nice people. 
it's just I don't know. Like I'm fishing at thirty feet of water and I can see the bottom. I, I tell everybody it's like fishing in the Bahamas. It's unbelievable. Yeah, let's talk about Clayton. Clayton, New York is actually my number one. It's the best place in the Northeast for fishing. But having said that, people viewing and listening, let's let's please let's respect this place because it is so mm. magical. Protect the fishery. And and Pasquale said it well. Like th- this place is beautiful. No matter how many people that we tell, like, yeah, you fish, you're fishing in 25 feet of water and you can see straight to the bottom. Yeah. They're like, dude, no way, no way. No, no, it's so true. It's like fishing in the Bahamas. It really is. And yep. aside from that, there's beautiful cliffs and there's islands. I mean, Thousand Islands. Like, there's just so much pristine wilderness on this lake. There's There's beaches that you can pull off. There's, you know, we talk about how sometimes it's difficult to find like your spot and on and on st lawrence river there's always undiscovered things that day you can drive 30 minutes you can drive an hour you can drive 15 minutes but you can always find something untouched with no with no boats on it in regards to the fishing community that is this whole river and you mentioned this just a very nice people but around clayton there's all these beautiful farms. They have cheese curds. My wife shouts out Sarah. They have cheese curds, and they have local vegetables, and there's distilleries, and there's so many wineries. We don't. We don't condone. Condone drinking. Yeah. Absolutely. Why are you cutting out of my thing? I've been just helping you. I'm the I'm the host. <laughs> but even if you don't fish, like it's definitely a, a considerable yes. vacation destination. Yep. Now. Let's talk about the fishing on St. Lawrence River. Obviously, there's largemouth and smallmouth, but there seems to be way more smallmouth. If, if you wanted to fish for largemouth, you could. You could go and, like, frog fish in the, in the reeds, and, oh, you, yeah. and you could flip docks and that sort of thing and definitely catch them. But you don't want to do that <laughs> just because we- there's so <clears throat> many more smallmouth spots. There's rock piles, and there's uh, these shoals and and you can clean up on smallmouth from three to five pounds all day long on a good day, but it, it I got engaged there. My wife loves this place. No strategy behind that move at all. Aside from the fishing, you 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 could catch fish all day long, but the St. Lawrence River is so dope because you can pull off into all these different harbors. Yes, Alexandria Bay, pull off and grab some tacos. Go to Clayton, hop off your boat, dock your boat, get There's some There's fuel, get some you get fuel. like Get fuel. It, you don't like, have to get off your boat. So coming from ocean fishing, it's like ocean fishing with a bass boat. You have all these amenities, and tra- and you could travel. and like We pulled up on some beaches, and my son snorkeled. Uh, let's talk about the first trip. You and my son snorkeled, and you literally like you came up out of the water, and you're like, there's smallmouth right no, no, in this those, little... those were largemouth. Oh, they were largemouth. And and you're like, hang on. And you 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 sight fished with a snorkel, got That's your pole, insane. Yeah, I forgot about that. Cast it into them and and hooked on to one of them. So, so the, that was like 1 p.m. hot. It was like 85 degrees. We pulled off. We dove down. We were in this little ravine. It was like an island and then another rock island here. And between that was like a shape like this. And in the bottom of the U shape was all this luscious grass. His son and me were swimming around and there was like tank largemouth. We we like I could see him as playing his day. Like cause you can see for They're just chilling fifty hundred feet under there. <clears throat> and I came up and I'm like, dude, there are slobs there. <laughs> like so I went back on the island over here and honestly I just reached up on my boat and I just threw a top water right across the channel that we were in and one bit it. But that's the kind of fishing that there is. Granted, it's it gets a lot of fishing pressure now. You gotta choose and, and in the summer the smallmouth are down like forty feet. It's tough. But uh it it's amazing. And yep. a lot of people are a little hesitant to fish the river because they feel like it's a lot of waves and that sort of thing. But for those of you guys listening, it's really not on a windy day, either the backside of of the Big Island in Canada is calm and the USA is windy, 
or vice versa. You can always find something that's out of the wind. Calm. The river's not. It's not scary. You got John boats. We see tons of John boats there. Oh yeah, definitely. And on calm days, you can zip the whole way to Lake Ontario, and and do whatever you want. For all you tin boat guys, like we see a lot of like twelve foot John boats. Like he said, I take my seventeen foot bass boat out there. And that gave me the confidence to travel and hit all these lakes. Just read the water, watch the wind, and you know if it's rough, just go slow. Like you don't need to do forty. Just pipe it down and just go. You're right. you're good to go. Yeah, for sure. But that's that's the best. That's my favorite place in the whole world, fishing or not. The food there's so much good food there. I my wife and I we get, we go to the same restaurant every year. They have spaghetti squash mac and cheese. They have a ton of good unique menu options all from like local farms and they use cheese from the area i'm gonna buy a house there i'm gonna buy a house there i think you should house with a dock house with a dock i will i will end up there at some point nice so that's my number two and that's my number one so my my top three is lake george and again there's lakes that fish way better than lake george but because of the vibe there it feels like you're in like northern maine near quebec Mm -hmm. It gets my number three spot, as well as like the community and the and the nice people and the food. Number two is Lake Champlain. It, that lake is just so big; it's just amazing. You, you can do whatever you want. Saint Lawrence River blows them both out of the water, though, oh, for yeah. me. Like, there's no better place on earth, man. And from Connecticut, it's an easy drive. It really is. Yeah, it's like two and a half hours back roads. I mean, it's five and a half hours from us. It's it's just I don't know. It's such an easy drive, and, you, and, and there's some we should touch on it. They have a a tackle shop there. Oh shoot! Shouts out Thousand Islands Bait Store sponsor yeah. us. It is it is the size of like five or six garages, and and it's it has more quality than any Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's I've been. Thousand Islands Bait Store so legit. <clears throat> there's no fluff. There's no like all this BS like clearance gear. They have gear that you need to catch fish, and yep. they and they have an awesome live bait section for those of you guys that do live bait. They have a whole like aquarium set up that's thirty feet long with shiners and and different types of minnows in it. They've got Berkeley Max scent flatworms. They've they've got all of the soft plastics that you need to catch smallmouth. They just they just do it right, man. I just I can't wait to go back. Can't wait to go back. So that's my top three. So my number one, ready for this one? Honestly, I can't remember what it was from the first episode. He never pays attention to me. Nice. <laughs> Needy. <laughs> Needy. My number one is Lake Winnipesaukee. Oh yeah, okay. Um yep. so That was on my honorable mentions. I'm I'm more into it. Like obviously I like to catch fish. I like to travel. Scenic wise, something about Lake Winnipesaukee. With a little fog in the water, with the sun rising, it just really there's a I had a special moment out there. It was uh it was cool. I really had to use my brain out there. They don't mark things as well as they should. Lake Winnipesaukee's a little sketchy. Yeah, definitely. I mean I was running like forty five and all of a sudden I'm like, Yeah, I'm in a foot and a half of water, I'm gonna hit rocks and I'm like, <laughs> let's just keep going. And I was out of the I was way out of the channel. I caught my PB largely there. We have a video of it. I, I don't know. It, for me, it was just the ramp. Being able to sleep in the water for free. Cooking on the water. Having power right there. Um, we didn't talk about <laughs> Loon. Loon uh, Museum. Yeah, so <laughs> Lake Winnipesaukee is my honorable mention. First honorable mention lake. It was number four. It got edged out slightly by Lake George. So here's the thing. Lake Winnipesaukee fishes better than Lake George. But Lake George, for me, I just like being away from everybody. And Lake George kind of makes you feel like you're away from everybody in the spring and fall. Yes. Lake Winnipesaukee is way busier. And that's why it got my number four spot. It fishes better, though. So we did we did go to Lake Winnipesaukee, and we found some really cool stuff truck camping the first being a boat ramp that has electricity obviously it's right on the water we didn't know so we didn't know it had electricity until we settled in for the night 
like I don't know, it had two Adirondack chairs and the sun was setting and we just sat there. Yeah. And we the people coming in and loading their boats, like it's all so a lot of this like everybody's like, Oh, why do you do this? It's it's for me it's a scenery, but the people. The people that these when you travel out of Connecticut, that's what it does for me. The catching a fish, obviously it's why we do it, but that's just a bonus. No, it's definitely cool to explore and we we meet people every single place we go. Like there's always like those fun moments that we have with random people in the mornings. But this particular ramp, there was outlets around the dock. We they didn't work at first and then we kind of just like walked the perimeter and then we found like a circuit breaker and just like <laughs> flipped the circuit panel on and then we had power. So there is a boat ramp. So we'll give this one away. It's if if you're interested in uh, a prime place to sleep, it's, it's Lee Mills in uh, Lake Winnipesaukee. If you just Google on Google Maps Lee Mills boat ramp, it'll come up. It is it is it is amazing. Please take care of this one. There's a portage on there. There's electricity. Um, there's a porta potty. Yeah, everything you need. And if you're gonna truck camp it, you're gonna get there either late at night or early in the morning, and you're gonna get a spot. It's uh, it's definitely go to. So. Before we found out there was power, we had to find power because I run lithium as a my boat and Captain Tyler over here does not. Yeah, so so we stayed there one night, completely chance, but we didn't really notice the, the power the first night. So we left and we're like, all right, we got to find power. So <laughs> on the way t- to the ramp, I saw like what looked like an abandoned nature center and... I'm like, all right, let's go check out this nature center. So we leave and we pull off. It's like a Saturday, Sunday, they're closed. And that's exactly what it was. It was an abandoned nature center. We pulled in. We see the power outlets like right next to the entrance. We both have extension cords and truck life. So I plugged in my boat, ran the cord over to the the wall of the nature center. I was getting some free charge. I took a little cat nap on the back deck of my boat. What was the name? Shout outs to Loon. It was some Loon Nature Center right yeah. there. If you looked on Google, it would probably be like the first one that came up. So the Loon Nature Center, we yeah, we pulled over, we plugged in. There wasn't even any loons there. There was no loons. We got gypped. There was loons out on the lake though, so shouts out to the lake. They didn't even offer us a tour. <laughs> so we pull in, two two trucks, two boats, back to back. I'm plugged in. I'm taking a cat nap. I don't have lithiums. He's Pasquale's got the lithiums. Shout out to Miller Tech. Thank you for an unbelievable year. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed to charge. So lo and behold, I'm gonna I'm gonna just, just gonna name her Greta. Gre- Greta. <laughs> so Greta Greta is like <laughs> so, so Greta comes out. Shouts out Greta though. So yeah, we we were definitely in the wrong. Yeah, we were. Yeah. And without Greta, we we wouldn't have been able to fish day two. So shouts out Greta. Thank and you, shouts Greta. out to all the nice people that support goons like us. Without Greta, I wouldn't have been able to charge my boat. So she comes out and she's very like she was scared. <laughs> she sees like she, she was, was nervous. She, she sees six five Pesquale and probably thought she was in danger. But she says. But once again, the whole the truck, the boat. She sees a nice truck. She sees a nice boats. Right away, like, they know, like, anybody doing harm or any whatever, they're not pulling a boat with a nice truck. Like, that's not how it works. So that kind of countered down right away, I believe. Well, she came out, and before she came out, uh, Pasquale was like, it, it was hilarious. Like, we were actually, like, plotting what we were going to say if somebody came out because it, it felt barren. It felt like nobody was around, but we just wanted a game plan. And he was game planning. He's like, yeah, we'll say that we booked a reservation for, we looked up, we like Googled a campground up the road. Closer by. We'll say we Googled this campground. Our reservation got canceled. We're scrounging for a place to stay. Something, something. And then literally as he was saying that, the door swung open. Greta came out full force. <laughs> and, and, and he didn't even go with that story. You, you went with something completely off the whim. I don't remember what it was. I wish I did. But it was like good. It was like ten yeah, out of ten. Yeah, yeah. Like total. Oscar I went total car salesman on her, <laughs> and she's like, "Just leave us a donation in the mailbox. I have no. to go home." Well, she said, uh, "She said, 
you're using our electricity. Yes. And, and I said, we'll pay for it. Do you have Venmo? <laughs> no, she did not. And she said, just leave a generous donation in the mailbox. And I'll grab it in the morning. T was like, well, do you take checks? Yes. And she was like, absolutely. Just leave it in the mailbox. And she, she ghosted. She left. And then, uh, so then she left. And, and we're like, well, he's like, I don't have a checkbook. I'm like, well, why did you say that? So, so he, I did. Yeah, yeah, he, he didn't, didn't have, have a checkbook. checkbook. I had a five and a single in my pocket. It was wrinkly, ripped up, um, something that a five-year-old would have in their pocket, and that's not enough. So we felt bad. So Tyler says, well, I have spare change. Long story short, we gave her, what, like twenty one fifty. We, we had gave... like twenty-one, twenty-two dollars Yep. Six was in, in a five and a, a single. And then I scrounged together like sixteen dollars and change from my cup holder. <laughs> it was more than the amps that I stole from the Wound Nature Center. Yes, definitely covered that. Yep. We 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 charged for like what two and a half hours. It was yeah, probably about two and a half hours. Yep. Got a full charge. Left that heavy bag of change in the mailbox. Yes, in a plastic bag. It said, "Have a nice day." We honestly left a little bit early just because we felt bad. But yes. all kidding aside. Thank you to people like that. Thank you to the Loon Nature Center. Greta, we're not clowning. We're not clowning. Greta. No, not at all. But people like that is why we're able to do these things. Yes. And, we, you know, we weren't there to harm anybody. We weren't there to litter or no. anything like that. So. And, and honestly, like, let's, let's be honest. So, like, when we're truck camping, visiting these different lakes, we're following every rule to the T. The, we are not littering. We are not. I mean, we we have we we are representing our, the channel, so we have to make sure everything is good to go. Um, yeah. So if you're gonna do any of this stuff or you're gonna follow what we do, don't litter. Don't you know? Go find Greta at the Loon Nature Museum and you know try to plug in. I would not do that again. She was very hospitable. Uh, I would pay for it. I mean, yeah, we, we, did, we paid we did. for those goods yeah, and services. Definitely. But I'm not going to, like, plan the next trip to Lake Winnipesaukee, Lee Mills Boat Ramp, say, hey, you know what? We're going to plug in at Loon Museum. No, we, no, I no. wouldn't plan on doing that. That, that was, was just kind of That like, was an audible. We were desperate. We were on the line of scrimmage. We saw the defense. The coverage shifted, and we had to pull an audible. You guys all heard, like, ski. <laughs> yeah, you guys all heard, like, ski bums. We're, like, we're like bass fishermen bums. Like, we're... We're just like, we don't know. The best part of our trips are, let's just go. We do a full send, and we don't know what's going to happen. We go to these ramps that we've never slept at or these parking lots, side of the roads, like, and we do not know if we are going to make it through the night without someone saying, please leave. No. <laughs> and, and, I, and so I spent many years driving cross country in a truck, and... I have experience of being told to leave a certain parking lot in, in a big rig. So I told Tyler that, you know, during our course of our trips that that could happen. And all you do is say, all right, no problem. And it's three in the morning and you just literally drive a mile down the road, find another parking lot and you just sleep there. And it is what it is. It, you know, and you just, everything you, you encounter or any person is just handle it with uh, kindness Absolutely. You'll be, and you'll be okay. Absolutely. So those are our top three lakes in the Northeast. Just to recap, Lake George, Lake Champlain, St. Lawrence River, Clayton, New York are my top three. Lake Winnipesaukee is my honorable mention. Pasquale, you want to recap your top three really fast? Top three are number one, Lake Winnipesaukee. Number two, St. Lawrence River, Clayton, New York, Alexandria Bay. Shout-outs to Thousand Island Bait Shop. And number three would be my home lake, Lake Zor. Love that. Now, let's talk about hidden gems. So, along our travels, we've we've fished a lot of lakes and moved around quite a bit, and we've explored quite a bit of lakes here in the Northeast. These are lakes that I think are worth hitting again. All of these lakes we've only hit one time, and they, and they were kind of cool, but they didn't crack the top three. Those three lakes that we mentioned are just so good that it's hard to beat them. But my number one hidden gem is in New Hampshire in its Lake Sunapee, Sunapee, Sunapee. Yes. However you pronounce it, Lake uh, I, New I Hampshire believe folks. It's Sunapee. Sunapee. Yeah. Either way, that lake is cool. It's small though. You can fish that whole lake in a day. 
we stayed at this really, really cool hotel. I think that was the best part. The hotel was definitely the best part. It, it was kind of like a Halloween. It would have made a great Halloween video. Super I had, spooky. I had such a cool idea for like this spooky music. We, we pulled up. <laughs> It was in the middle of nowhere. We, of course, we needed to charge the boat. Yeah, so so it's always about... We took my boat. This particular time where, you know, one truck, one boat, let's stay in the Airbnb. Well, we got to charge. And I'm like, well, I see power. And he's like, where do you see power? I'm like, well, how much cord do you have? We always run with like 100 foot of cord. There was Christmas lights. And I know with Christmas lights, there's always a plug-in point. We back up. There's two cars in the parking lot. We're one of two, so we back the boat up next to the the hotel, and I'll try to look the the place up and put it in the description. I don't know if I'll find it, and we we run the cord from my boat to the to the Christmas lights while we're on camera. They have camera on every square footage of the property, but there was nobody there. Even, no, even no. when we were going there, we booked the place, and they're like, "Hey, just so you know, no one will be there. Check yourself in, grab a key, good night." Like, yeah, oh yeah. We're like, all right, and we're sweet. like, cool. So like. <laughs> As, literally, as I'm plugging into the Christmas lights, I'm looking up at a camera, and I'm like, hello. <laughs> and I plug in. I'm like, And we had to break the ground off my extension cord. Yes, we also had to break the ground. We don't recommend doing that. No. No, don't no, no. Do we don't condone unsafe electrical practices. No. No, no, no. But it worked. It worked. Yes. And we got a full charge for the morning. Yep. And when we went in, there it was so cool. There was a couple and a, a man from Tennessee in the... Uh, in the living area just kind of chilling they had a full kitchen with like a 14 inch or 16 inch cast iron pan hanging on the wall it was like a ski lodge it was like a ski lodge and i was like what's up with this kitchen and he's like yeah guests can use this kitchen so it was like a commercial kitchen with like if you think about it we could almost do another trip there and do a dishes and fishes yep a cook (laughs) there we could shoot it there like no one no one would bat, bat an eye at that. We, we could. Yeah. We should. We will. <laughs> it was like, it was like, I thought the place was haunted. It was so cool. The floor, and I'm a big boy. The floors were creaky. No, yeah, it was, it was not stable. There was <laughs> like a weird tunnel from our room. I did not sleep good that night. I slept like a baby. But the hallway, when you're walking up the stairs, was like... It, pushing my shoulders together it was so tight in there i did fit between the toilet and the wall they didn't even have a bathroom remember the bathroom was down the hallway it was like a community bathroom yeah that despite all of its flaws that place was a five out of five awesome experience and we might be back we will be back you know what squam no it was not squam squam on your list yes honorable mention so one of my honorable mentions was Squam. It's in New Hampshire. It's close to Winnipesaukee. I believe it's a little bit north of it. It was cool. It was definitely, it was a very small lake. A lot of good structure. A lot of good rock flats. A lot of good rock piles. One of our highlights that we always, you know, why it's cool to go to, because they had a, we slept at the ramp. It was a cool little ramp. It was busy. So Squam. <laughs> Actually, yeah, there's some good, uh, there's some good stories behind Squam Lake. But... The fish at Squam Lake weren't big, no. but to your point, it was an epic structure lake. There was rocks everywhere. Like, like both the New Hampshire lakes that we went to were like, you would wreck your boat if you don't have a map. Oh, yeah. Uh, tread with kind of caution. Yeah, so. literally, if you go out of the channel, you're going to hit rocks. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. The fish at Squam Lake were small, but the lake was beautiful. And let's, let, let's talk about the channel markers. Like... They're not like what you're used to, like in New York or Connecticut or maybe Massachusetts. They're literally a stick. Some of the channel markers were a stick with paint on them. So if you're ripping and you're hauling ass, like you're, you got to pay attention. It comes up quick. About Squam Lake is there's one boat ramp and it's in, so you launch the boat and it's in a river that runs perpendicular to the ramp and, yep. and the river's like 40 feet wide so every boat has to go in this river and there's a restaurant to the right and the lakes to the left so there's tons of boat traffic remember when we were leaving and how many people were wrecked like, oh yeah like we were leaving qualified captain shouts out qualified captain qualified captain would have had a field day 
Excuse me, sir. Do you have a pair of wire cutters? <laughs> One guy literally, because because we we the ramp was chaotic. Well, and and one of us, you know, one of us will grab the other one's truck. We we help each other. So while while I was sitting with my boat, his boat was at the ramp. He was getting his truck. I was sitting with my boat, and a gentleman comes up to me. He's like, "Do you have a pair of wire cutters?" <laughs> Very and, random question. And I was like, "No, but I have uh, like some scissors. You know, I, I, I cut fishing line <laughs> and like that sort of thing. Here you go." He's like, "I have a channel marker in my." <laughs> I stuck in my over. prop and his boat is at the dock and there's a buoy on his prop and there's a steel cable like thicker than my finger. yeah and it's not any type of boat it is literally like a hundred thousand dollar wakeboarding <laughs> boat there's like six people on it like yeah like, <laughs> yeah they're just, we're, they're just like what are what are we gonna do what are we gonna do yeah so he takes my scissors and and obviously he doesn't make a dent but he needs, he, he needs like bolt cutters for this thing. But so while we're both docked there, there's 12 different boats at this ramp swearing and just. Oh, yeah. Chaos. It's a mess. It's a it's an absolute mess. So if you're going to go to Squam Lake, go when the weather's cold in the morning or in the evening. Absolutely. That ramp is the worst. Yep. And the fish aren't even that big. But the, the lake is pretty cool. Yeah, very, very scenic. Like, I always fall back under that. It's all about catching fish, but at the end of the day, it is very scenic. It was just, I have a lot of pictures. Um, It, it was unbelievable. Very scenic. Yep, absolutely. My next lake on my honorable mentions is Great Sakandaga. Okay. So, I'm going to throw a little topographic map shot of Great, Great Sakandaga right here. You can see on the top right, it's kind of like a very narrow stretch. You start on a dam and you're looking down and it's kind of, it kind of gives you like a small lake vibe. Yeah. It's kind of cool. But by the time you reach the ramp and we, we launched on Broad Alban, New York ramp. Yep. It feels like a completely different lake down there. It is absolutely enormous. I'll text them. Nick, I'll text you. <laughs> Actually, let me call. Pause. <laughs> no, no, keep rolling. Give me gold. Hey, bro. Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? What are you doing? I'm uh, driving to, uh, to grab some pizza and then go to a haunted house with Dana. Smart. Hey, Nick, it's Pasquale. How you doing? What's up, man? Got a quick question for you. So we're actually, we're refilming uh, episode two of the podcast. Uh -huh. One of the things we're talking about is hidden gem lakes. And one of my hidden gems is Great Sakandaga. Yeah. And I was talking about how my brother-in-law caught his PB pike on this lake. Are you cool with me sharing that detail? Yeah, everybody knows about Sakandaga. Okay. Right. All right, <clears throat> sounds good. And how big was that fish? Probably like 44, 43, 44 inches, 25 pounds. And and Nick, you're you're live on air, so that like you pulled him through the ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're filming right now. Get more than this. <laughs> and like and like you 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 pulled this behemoth of a fish through the ice. Uh yeah, no, Saga Dog is where it's at for for All Mike. Right. Okay, I just wanted to check because I just talked about this story. What's that? Walleye too. Walleye too, and we were just talking about an ice fishing video for this winter. Maybe there. Yeah, you know what they um, they say? Sagandaga is an ice fishing lake too. It's not like a uh, boat fishing lake. They call it like an ice fishing lake. We'll have to we'll have to take it up on that. Yeah, I'll show you what's up. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. All right, bro. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye. All right, have fun. See ya. So, yeah, great Sakandaga. Like, killer pike there. I think the state record was caught there. Do you want to talk about, like, how, like, the low water and, like, all that? Oh, yeah. That oh, was I the, forgot about that. That, that was the day we hit three lakes at once. It was 11 and a half hours of driving. We started at Lake George. We bailed because the bite went goodbye. 
And we're like, where are we going to go next? And and T knows I, I'm a man that loves to hold the wheel in my hand. And I'm like, let's go to Lake Champlain. We get to Lake Champlain. The, the wind was not the way they forecasted it. It was wicked rough. So we bailed from Lake Champlain and we went to, well, what's close or on the way home was Great Lake Sakandaga. We were super excited because it looked pretty cool. As we're rolling up to the ramp, about 20 miles out, there was low water, super low water. They did a drawdown. But we still went out there and we caught a bunch of shorts and pretty much it was 11 and a half hours of driving, three lakes. It was a quiet ride home. Yeah. We caught fish there. We did, but a bunch of shorts. Nothing yeah. crazy because they yeah. the water level was low. It was windy and cold that day too. It was, it was yeah. not easy fishing. No, not at all. Yeah. Yep. But we will be back there oh, and we're going to catch our PB bike I, there this winter. I think this winter. That is where I want to put my truck on the ice. And sleep on the ice in my truck. Same. <laughs> Wait, do you have anything else in your honorable mention lakes? Uh, that was my. I have. I have another one. I have Sunapee. I have Lake Dunmore, New Hampshire. It was no, small. No, no. tons I, of grass. I, kind I, of a cool lake and great Sakandaga. I like to always shout out the local lakes. One of my honorable mentions is Lake Lilianoa. Very scenic. Once again, when you're going north, Lovers Leap area. A lot of smallmouth, largemouth, uh, tiger musky, pike. It's a good lake. Check it out. Connecticut has some cool lakes for sure. And uh, no matter what species that you want in Connecticut, bass, tiger musky, pike, saltwater, we've got them here. Trout. So definitely can appreciate that. Last section for this episode, lakes to avoid. What lakes will you not want to? to go to or it, least favorite least favorite yeah. my f- uh my first lake on this list on lakes to avoid is lake saratoga and this is in saratoga new york we went here after a sakandaga run i want to say i'm just looking at the map here yeah it's right next to sakandaga it's it's small it was very dirty the water clarity was like zero Full of dead grass. During a lightning storm. During a lightning storm. we <laughs> Yeah, the weather was really bad. <laughs> uh, the lake was just not... You couldn't even... Even if you wanted to fish offshore, you couldn't. Because it was just so dirty and full of debris and trash. We did catch a few fish on a spinnerbait. But it, it, it was more of like a dirty party city lake. It, I would not go back. I no. would Two out of five. The only reason I gave it a two is because the smallmouth that we caught were kind of decent. But So there was a restaurant on the lake. Kind of cool. Thought about maybe stopping there. That's cool. Whatever. But the fishing culture and community, not good. Definitely better lakes within driving distance from Lake Saratoga. Absolutely. Do you have anything on your list for lakes to avoid? On the way back from our first ever... Um, St. Lawrence River trip, we decided on the way back, I don't know why, we decided to stop at Colebrook <laughs> in Connecticut, yeah. A lot of promise. <laughs> it's it's one of those fisheries that when you talk to somebody like 30, 40 years ago, it was like the place to go fish in Connecticut, and somehow they failed it. So... I don't know why when we went there, the water was 30 feet below where it should have been. There is promise. It, it, it is like you're fishing in in like uh, Vegas or like the desert. It kind of is. It, it's, it's, it's you know, very unique. But I think it's one of those lakes that a lot of the lakes in Connecticut, if they don't protect, it's going to turn into. Um, they got like the water is 30 feet low and, and they, they need to uh, they need to protect it. So that's on my list. The ramp's funny. When you oh, launch your dude. boat, you got to like walk like a mile to park your truck. You have to back down like <laughs> oh, yeah. 300 feet. Well, because the water's 30 feet lower than it should be. Yeah. Well, still, it was a long ramp. Yeah. and But I will say this. If they figure it out or they rebuild this fishery, I, I honestly would say that it could be a place to go. Yeah. It, it has the makings of 
maybe a good smallmouth fishery. It's all rocks. Yep. There's a few points, but basically it feels like a big oval rock pit. Yep. Like you said, Vegas. That was a good analogy, actually. Yep. There's a dam right next to it. When we went, all we caught was like 12-inch smallmouth on the bank, like junk fishing. If there's anybody that watches this that wants to educate us on Colebrook, I honestly would love to go back out there. I thought about revisiting it. Show me how to fish Colebrook. And I, I, I would meet you out there. I'll take you on my boat. This guy's freaking plugging. No, seriously. Now. Like, I'll take you on my boat. Meet me at the ramp. Let's go. And we'll fish it. And and show, show me the juice. So maybe it'll be a hidden gem. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it is. My second lake to avoid on my list is Lake George in peak summer. Okay. And I remember we went Labor Day. Yep. Boat traffic. It was wonderful weather. Yep. It was epic. Like, this was after April spring break trip. We slayed the smallmouth. Then Memorial Day May trip, we slayed the largemouth. So we, we, we had two back-to-back really epic trips in the spring. And then, we obviously, we lived our lives, and we worked forever. And then Memorial Day came around, and we're like, Lake George, like, we're slaying them. We're going back. We went. And I remember we launched the boat. It was obviously beautiful weather. Yep. And as soon as we get off of the boat ramp, Million Dollar Beach, whatever it's called, we pass like around the bend. And it was the most boats that I've ever seen <laughs> oh, yeah. in a single view. Yeah. And, I, and I literally remember like, Pasquale, let's count the boats. And I think we hit 70. And like literally it was like one, two, three, four, five, like all the way to 70 in our view. And, 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 and the weather was glass. The reason we went, obviously, we talked about why truck camping is awesome. The weather was glass calm, but it was like it was like 20 mile an hour winds that day because of all oh, the yeah. boat traffic. I mean, wherever we go, there's boat traffic. Not like that. No. I, <laughs> like, if you were to message us and say, well, what would you say? Where's the most boat traffic? I would say during peak season... I would say Lake George would be number one. Lake Winnipesaukee would be number two. There was huge ocean boats out there. Yeah. Um, my boat did not stay in the water. And then Clayton, yeah. New York, Alexandria Bay, St. Lawrence River. They get a lot of boat traffic. But I will say the boat traffic stays in the channels. Yeah. You can dodge it by going behind these islands. Lake George, it's like a big pit, like a big open pond. If yeah, you know. it's like two two stretches. If you get a five mile an hour wind with boat traffic, you're talking about three to like six foot rollers. <laughs> like it's that bad. It's annoying. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. That being said, if you're gonna fish Lake George, go when it's cold. Yep. All, all of these lakes. Oh yeah. Just man up and go when the weather sucks. Because Dress for success. You'll catch more fish when the weather sucks and there's not tra- uh, boat traffic out there. My last lake to avoid, and we didn't talk about this this, this episode. Uh, we went to Lake Wallenpopik, PA. Okay. I'm, I'm a PA boy. I'm from Pennsylvania, born and raised. Not born, actually. Can we? I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pennsylvania in near Pittsburgh, but... This Lake Wallenpopik is right over the Connecticut border. It's about two hours away. We stayed at this awesome campground, but the lake is a little weird. It's known for inland striped bass nice. and walleye. Yeah. So we wanted to go and catch those fish, obviously. So we went and we got there. We set up camp, whatever. And then we launched our boat in the evening and we fished into the night. And it was cool, man. It was really cool, actually. Like, there was nobody fishing during during the day. Yeah. And then at night it was everybody was out. So yep. it was the most boats I've ever seen at night. And they were all gathering by this boat ramp. So mm-hmm. naturally, you know, I hate to say it, but we had to see what was going on. So we went over to this boat ramp and there was like 30 boats over by this ramp and on the electronics there was fish everywhere. Oh yeah. So I'm assuming they were walleye, but they wouldn't bite. No matter what we threw, they would not bite. And did we hook up at all there? Bet just bass in the during the day. But 
we had a few walleye followers also in the morning, yep. but he, I talked to a few of the guys that were fishing there in, at night, and I was like, what, the, what are you guys fishing for? They're like, walleye. And I was like, what are you throwing? And they said, just like these little uh, translucent jerk baits. We were not prepared for that lake. We, I was throwing jerk baits too. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they weren't translucent, but like, come on, how much no, of a difference can I got it make? You, yeah. And, and I was marking so many fish on my graph. So long story short, this lake could be magical. And we saw a lot of pictures of guys holding like 30-inch stripers. The cool thing about seeing that was at the end of the tournament, when I caught nothing, everybody else caught fish, I was like, wow, there was actually fish there. We knew there was fish here. There's fish everywhere. So I, I started following them on Facebook. and They have a Facebook page, and I watch them through the year, and these guys are catching quality landlocked stripers the whole season the whole year after we left because we went early in the season and uh it was absolutely like we didn't know what we were doing so i mean if anybody's been there just you know give some comments like I, that's another place i would like to revisit like i would honestly like to go back i want to go back to yeah and and it sh- it shouldn't necessarily be in my lakes to avoid list. If you want to bass fish, I think you might want to avoid it. But if you want to just fish for some type of new species, the quality of stripers and walleye that they catch here are yeah. pretty pretty decent. No, I've been following them for the after we went there the rest of the season, and these people, the guys that know how to fish it, they are catching quality. They are absolutely catching quality. And also, you you brought your son there. Yep. And that was like the first truck camping episode or truck camping thing we did with my son. And it was, it will ever, it will forever be a memory that I have because he was so into it. And we were fishing horribly. We were miserable, but he was into it because he, he loved the whole truck camping, everything about it. And, and I, like I talked about in the first time we shot this was, uh, he made it through the whole night and he woke up and he was super excited and he was like dad he was like i made it and i'm like what i'm like what what the hell are you talking about and he goes <laughs> i made it i'm like all right what would where did we make it and he goes i made it through the night and i'm like all right i'm like oh my god you made it through the night like he was so oh. proud of himself for making it through the night and i'm just like <laughs> and i'm just like i that's a parent win yeah like he was like he just wanted to get through the night while i'm pressuring us to catch some damn fish and his whole goal and his eight-year-old mind was let's make it through the night and i'm i never had a doubt we want to make it through the night i remember dude i I remember waking up like i was like (laughs) and, and he's like dad i made him like Damn, I hope you made it through the night. Like, geez, yeah. we're trying to catch fish here, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah. I hope you can sleep. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it was the first trip that he went on, and, and he, he he's in love with the truck camping. Yeah, he likes I, it. I will say that. I mean, he hasn't been on a lot of trips. And that's why I talked about, like, adding, you know, the 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 rack tent, if you will. I want to keep building on on that whole truck the truck life, if you will, um, making it more for him. Like, if you're going to do, like, the whole truck, the traveling, the fishing – like bring you know bring it home with the kids like absolutely so that's pretty much it for my uh my lakes to avoid and honorable mentions anything else on your lakes to avoid yeah so i'm gonna i'll hit them quick uh next one would be bantam i i love bantam it has a special place in my heart but the ramp is horrible there's like a pothole where you can't launch or load your boat properly and that really steers me away from that place i there's guys that catch quality largemouth there i just the ramp really for me and do you want to hear my next one i mean this is gonna probably upset a lot of people all right let's hear it candlewood Mm. yeah Yeah. so (laughs) candlewood for me i mean that's a I would honestly say it's one of the one one of the better fisheries in, in New England. What ruins that place for me is the amount of tournaments on that body of water. They're split between two basically public launches, public ramps, and it gets insanely too much traffic for me. 
Also, there's something going on with that lake that a lot of other guys have touched on where there's too many grass carp, too much, something going on in the grass not growing. I would say that if they don't start protecting that fishery, that Candlewood is definitely going to, in our lifetime, definitely not fare well. Yeah, it's a little sad. The, the, the culture on Candlewood is, is, you know, every weekend there's three tournaments, 150 boat trailers. You know, that lake isn't the biggest. It, it's been the biggest lake in Connecticut, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that big. No. Uh, you're, the spots that you know, everybody knows. Yep. That lake, it, the, the, the amount of pressure that it gets, and there is quality fish there. There's no doubt about that. Oh, absolutely. There's quality largemouth. We know people personally that catch every tournament, they catch 20-something pounds. If you go on a weekday, Candlewood is awesome. Absolutely. If you go on a weekend. We had a magical night there that you made me see the light where it was, um, you know, we just, it, it fish, we, we always talk about, this doesn't fish like a normal lake. During the week, Candlewood for us, fishes like a normal lake. If you throw certain baits here or there, it fishes the way it should. For some reason, during the weekend, it changes between all the pressure of the tournaments and everybody fishing and the lack of grass. It changes from, it doesn't fish like a normal lake. Something has to happen there, or or it's not going to fare well in our future. Yeah, I would agree. And it, it's such a good fishery that tournament fishing isn't going anywhere. But the Candlewood culture is is tough. Yeah. And, and yep. That lake giveth and taketh away. It can be awesome, and it can also be very very hard. Yep. All right, guys. So we covered why you might consider turning your pickup truck into a camping vehicle slash uplander. The pros and cons of that, as well as our favorite lakes and our lakes to avoid in the Northeast USA. That's all we've got for this episode. If you guys like this episode, definitely subscribe to the channel. Check us out on both YouTube and uh, Apple Podcasts. We'll be on both of those venues. If you guys want to know anything, definitely drop it in the comments. I'll respond to the comments. Yep. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.